Okay, everybody, this is Sean Hackett uh, from Hackett Financial. He's been uh, a great learning source for me to learn more about agriculture, agricultural products and commodities. Uh, Sean's definitely, he goes on Real Vision as well as, uh, what's that show? I, I watch it all the time on uh, Iowa PBS. Market to Market. Market to Market, yes. And yeah. Market to Market. And, you know, I see Sean on all these things all the time. And I always wanted to get him on to talk to everybody just because it's it's fascinating stuff. And he looks at things in such a different way from other traders and from a real ground up approach, micro to macro, macro to micro, he covers it all. So, um, Sean, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into this business? Well, I mean, I started off in stocks in the 1990s. Um, but always had a, my, uh, my heart was always in agriculture, always. So when I moved down to Florida here in 99, John Roach, who was a big grain analyst in the Midwest, was starting an office here in Boca Raton. And so I just called him out of the blue and I said, I can help you grow your office. And uh, so he agreed and I worked with him for four or five years and, um, you know, got a lot of understanding of grain markets uh, and and went out on the road with him and did a lot of things. And at some point you know, I started to develop my own, uh, my own approach that was a little different than his. And so it, it naturally required uh, me to just do my own thing, which I started in 07 as Hacker Financial Advisors, uh, specializing in agricultural price forecasting, mainly for producers and users. And obviously for speculators who want to put some money in this area, an area that most speculators don't tend to spent put much of their money in in fact I, I can't tell you how many times i'll get some pretty successfully wealthy people that's i've never had one dollar in agriculture my entire career so this is my first foray and hard to imagine that but it's the truth so it's yeah. it's i think it's one of the re remaining undiscovered nuggets in the investment world is agriculture and so i'm glad to be a conduit of, of a voice in that in that space so and we, we talk about that a lot, which is the, the fact of relative, I talk about something called relative value a lot, which isn't like relative strength, it's, and it's not exactly value investing, it's the fact that agriculture and commodities have been at this level lately that is so undervalued compared to everything, even still, even after this run, it's still so undervalued compared to everybody else that I've been pushing people to, hey, look into the futures markets. Like there's some major areas and some major areas of growth. And, you know, these things, when they trend, they don't stop. You know, they, they have major trends. They yeah. go on for long periods of time. And there are a lot smoother trends in stocks. Stocks, you know, if you back test a stock, it's very mean reverting. If you back test uh, commodities, they're not. For example, if you have a, the S&P 500, you have a system that buys on four days down on the S&P 500, you can make some money with that system, you know, it, it's short-term trading, very short -term. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if you did that same system in commodities, you get blasted because they, <laughs> they tend to, four days down can start a trend, yes. uh, you know? So it's yes. kind of this very different market and you kind of have to understand it in a different way. And that's the, the beautiful thing about it. So I, I agree, like more people really, most people, I mean, people, when I, when I talk to clients, they think I have a grocery store. They, they talk to me and they go, oh, you, you have a grocery store. No, I trade futures. Yeah. It's the, oh, so you have a grocery store. No, no, it's not a grocery store. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it, it's you're, you're right. It's such a area that not many people trade, not many people look into. And it's real. there's so much to do in there. And that, not to mention, it diversifies your portfolio. Uh, in a in a crazy way that you can't get from any other market. Most stocks, if you're in a crash situation, everything's going down. But commodities, I mean, you can remember 2018, great example of this where you had oil crashing and natural yeah. gas exploding. You know, I know. And it's this is this happens all the time. Just this last couple of weeks, lumber has been going up and up while the market's been going down. So yeah, you know, I, I think it's important for many many areas. And I want also to be very clear, you know, where we are on the time horizon food chain, you know, we're, yeah, we have to define what's long-term in commodities versus what's long-term in stocks. Long-term in commodities, my definition is looking out nine months, 12 months, 18 months. I mean, that's a longer term trade. Whereas, you know, this people look at days, hours, minutes, weeks, you know, we're looking more on that nine, 12, 18 month horizon for our hedging and also for our 
training recommendations. And so, you know, we're, we're not looking to get in and get out. We're looking for a couple of smart things to do on either side of the market that our work is telling us can trend and then getting on that trend and positioning uh, in, in such a fashion that we can ride that trend to when we think the risks are starting to get stacked against you. So. Perfect. And that, that fits with our time frame too. Uh, I think that's the most overlooked time frame in general because you have buy and hold and then you have really short-term traders. And most yeah. of the funds are so focused on having their monthly mm -hmm. returns that they're in and out in a month. And so if you can kind of focus on that medium time frame, it, it's between buy and hold and short-term, you know, you can really get kind of a major edge in it. Well, that's what we've been doing. That's been our edge. That's been our window um, and all our work, whether it's our natural climate cycle work, whether it's our capital flows insiders work, whether it's some of our agronomy work, we all are structured to see, can we find something in that sweet spot that can really trend in that window where we have a pretty good advantage where other, everyone else is, you know, not focusing on at this point. And that's, uh, you know, we've been pretty successful in, in doing that. So. Wonderful. Yeah. So hopping into it. So um, starting with the fed, you know, uh, I, I always start with what's the Fed doing? What's the dollar doing? What are currencies doing? Which kind of helps me then to go into more of a micro standpoint. So how much does the Fed affect um, the commodity prices? Well, in theory, right? There's, there's, there's practice and there's theory. In theory, if they're printing a lot of money, in theory, hard assets should go up. Doesn't always work out quite like that. This can be a lot of delayed reactions uh, to and fro. We try to focus, not, remember the US dollar index as it's constructed is primarily the reverse of the Euro, which is not really that important to com agricultural commodities. Absolutely. So we try to focus on things like the Brazilian real, um, you know, things like maybe the Russian ruble or the Australian dollar, things that are a little more tied to the agricultural currency translation effect to U.S. price markets and, and try to figure out what's going on. What, what are the Fed actions going to do or not do against those currencies? Um, not necessarily is the euro going to be up or down. We, we think on the margin, that doesn't really actually make that much difference. So for example, we've had this very, very strong rally in the dollar here, um, mainly as a reflection of the euro weakening, but the com agricultural commodities overall you know, have been sort of stable to higher for the most part. You know, they're not really crashing like you would expect them to crash if the dollar were rising against. So like the real has been stable. You know, the, the, the agricultural commodity currencies have actually been fairly stable relative to what the dollar has been doing. So we try to focus on that and get a good handle on what we think that looks like over that window, that 9, 12, 18 month target. And so that sets the frame of what are the possibilities? If the real is crashing, that sets off a certain degree of possibilities. Yes. If it's rising, it sets a different set of possibilities. And then through that lens, we focus on the weather, on other things to try to determine, all right, what, what can the price be? Coffee fundamentals could be five in, in a certain environment or could be two in a certain environment based upon the currencies and other things. So we have to just determine where are we in that? And, 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 and that's not easy to do, by the way. No. Um, uh, and no one does it perfectly and, and, and neither do we. But, you know, we, we at least try to have a good handle on where we think we are and so that we can at least establish that risk profile from when we put a recommendation out to our farmers or to our traders. So, yeah, I mean, uh, that's a great point. It's something we talk about a lot, too, which is uh, we just looked it up to get the exact weights today, which is 57.6 percent is the weighting of the euro and the dollar index. Uh, you know, that's a massive weight. And so you're right. It's, it's this reflection of the euro. And so when so many people, like you're saying, we just had this massive rally in the dollar, but did the Aussie dollar make new lows at that time? Uh, it did for a split second, but gave it right back. Did a lot of the currencies make new lows? No, they didn't. They didn't. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's so important to understand that there's all these different um, currencies and not to mention which ones reflect, like you said, the Aussie dollar and the Brazilian real. Uh, you know, you have these commodity currencies, even the, the CAD being a good one for oil. Uh, yeah. you know, so you have all these commodity currencies, and these are more important to look at than just the dollar index, and that's especially the euro. Absolutely. We, 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 we you know, we kind of look at like the, for grain markets, for example, the real is extremely important, right? Because Brazil is such a dominant exporter of corn and soybeans and that sort of thing. 
uh, coffee, sugar. Uh, and we look at how we've had these big rallies, despite the fact that the real remains, you know, kind of in the sideways trade near the lows of its of all time lows. Yeah. So we've we've had a we've had a rally not due to any currency translation effect, simply because the fundamentals changed enough that we got this big rally. But our thought process, and we've been writing about this more and more in the last few months, is we think we might be heading for some kind of an uptrending Brazilian real. Yeah. Um, you know, over the next couple of years. And if we were to unleash a strong real, even if the fundamentals stayed exactly what they were and they didn't change at all, mm -hmm. we could get big rallies in grain markets just from that alone happening. Um, I always view the the the, uh, the the coffee market in the 2000s. The coffee market had a steady rally from 2003 all the way to 2007. Yet the price in reals on the ground didn't really change that much. It was a translational effect of the real rallying constantly during that period of time that allowed the u.s price to continue to rally with stable fundamentals that's so so yeah. in a sense currency is a fundamental in how something is priced so very interesting that Absolutely. you know if i'm right about the real i don't i don't even have to be right about a bullish scenario fundamentals i just have to be right that they're not going to get demonstrably bearish from here and we get a big rally in markets just on that metric alone if i'm correct so yeah Good, good point. Um, great point. And that's something that I think so many people overlook when it comes to commodities in general. So the, the way the flows are going globally, the way the currencies are moving globally, especially like you're talking, and you're very good at this. Uh, this is what I really enjoy your commentary on the currencies and what affects where. Um, you know, you're talking about South Africa and what could affect, you know, what crops are in this area, what crops are in Brazil and how the weather affects that. So we'll we'll jump into that a little bit, too, because that's something I wanted to pick your brain on, too, is where sure. do you think we're we we see um, we're in well, we're talking about Brazil. Let's keep talking about Brazil. So you made a great call on coffee. Um, wonderful call. You know, the, for our signals, we had a breakout. It was it was great. Continued, still going to this day. Um, yeah. So when you're setting up a trade like that, and you're looking at the currency, you're looking at the weather, you're looking at the crops. How do you set this up? Well, I mean, you know, I mean, I want to be, be very clear. You know, we're not what I call hardcore chartists, like maybe you are. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's really not. But we know enough to be dangerous. Mm -hmm. So. All we do is say, look, we really like what's going on with coffee. The fundamentals are getting really bullish to us. This weather is once in a 50 year combination of things with drought and frost and all those things that we have been talking about in our reports all last year. Um, and so we think we ought to have an outsized move. You know, what would be a logical first place for the market to go before taking a rest? You know, and if you look at a coffee chart, you know, 182 dollars was the initial rally. We, we were talking about coffee was in the 120s, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I structure a trade for a rally to that level. Yeah. You know, and so, you know, the combination of futures, some, some options, bull call spreads, there's different ways you can set it up. But I think, you know, that's your initial move that the market should go to before it takes a rest. And then we can reassess. Mm -hmm. Is that it? Is it factored all in? Is there more? What, you know, what's going on? And, and then you, so, so for as an example, we had this frost that we had predicted was going to be more highly probable last year. And not only did we not have, Frost, we had three of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. First one in 26 years. So we had this big spike trade. We actually overshoot two, and but then we had the typical hangover. Oh, it's, you know, and we came crashing. But then we, our assessment was, well, the frost, this is, this is a new thing. This is adding to the, to the drought. There's no way, because it crashed from like 215 down to 170s. So there's no way 170s, in our view, is pricing all of this in. So we reestablished positions and saying our next logical place for the market to go will be the 240 area. If you're looking at a long-term chart, say that's the next place that I think this fundamentals can take it before it may be time for a rest and a reassessment. So I positioned trades for move to there. And sure enough, it went there. And now we're in, you know, we, we tried to bank through 250, had a bearish reversal. And now we're sort of in this, what are we going to do now? So yeah. now we're in the third assessment. Is that it? Is there more to go? And, you know, I'm still in the discovery. I'm still trying to figure out. I don't think it's over. I think we might have another run, um, but we might have done enough for now. We might need to do some backing and feeling sideways trade, um, working some of the sentiment off because, you know, the sentiment got so bullish there for a little while. It, even the person um, who runs the coffee shop was bullish coffee, you know, and then yeah. you got to worry about that. Yeah. But 
So that's which we try to try to do these in pieces where we think a, a good solid trade is, but we try not to bet on the entire move because things can change. Yeah. We have an idea of something, but then a rogue wave comes along and changes everything about what we thought and we have to be nimble about it. So we want to make sure we pick chunks of, of a move that we think are reasonable, that are achievable, that we can do uh, quite well on, and then have a period of reassessment, risk aversion, and then reassess whether we want to go at it again, or are we just done with this trend? Is this trend over for now? We're moving on to something else we think is a better risk reward. So nice. And that, yeah, that's that's great. Um, and then we'll get into your what you also have is a smart money algorithm. Um, right. very interesting piece that you put in your research, um, which is basically using the COT reports to kind of understand what the smart money is doing. Um, how important is that for you to figure out where you want to be and how you want to be positioned in the markets? It's, it's very important. It's not the only tool. No tools is, is, should be ever relied upon in, in its sole entirety. Yes. Um, MIT in 1997 with long-term capital management shows you how one model can break <laughs> down really, really fast. But um, you know, we're, we're not so presumptuous to think that we're so smart that we know everything and that we don't need help from others. And, and, and we, of course, do. We don't know. We, we know a lot, but there's a lot of things we just don't know and can't know. So we really do feel that this collective group that we've identified in each market with its own DNA markers gives us a good read on what are they doing with their money at this moment in time with them assessing everything that they've assessed. So maybe it's the seed dealer and then it's the elevator and it's the Chinese trader. And, you know, all these people are in the market with their view, making decisions. What are they doing collectively? And it helps us, you know, if we're wildly, wildly bullish a market, yet they are just, just giving bearish signals. You know, we're going to take a pause and say, we're missing something. What are we missing? You know, what, what, you know, what, what, you know, let's, let's, let's do some more homework here because they're not acting in a manner that would be consistent with what we're seeing. So it allows us instead of rushing forward into a trade, it says to pause, let's spend some more time on this. Maybe there's something we didn't uncover yet that we need to, that is more bearish than we think, or, or sometimes it confirms it. And it's like, wow, they are really on board with this. And the other thing, and I, and I, in this last podcast I did, which I'm, I think you should have received yeah. uh, that we, that we went over that. Uh, to your court. Yeah. Yeah. There's different patterns. So it's not like every, you know, just like chart patterns, there's different there's head and shoulders, there's double tops, there's all kinds of, you know, cup and saucer. Well, in, in, in smart money, there's different patterns that develop that can be bullish or bearish depending on how they are acting relative to price action. And we try to point some of those things out. For example, when a market's running away to the upside and the smart money is flat, meaning they're not willing to sell anymore, that's very bullish. That's telling you that they're normal, they normally would be selling into a rally. Mm. They, they've they've break, broken away. So your natural seller isn't selling anymore. That means that you're entering a selling vacuum that they've decided whatever there's going on, that they just, it's too bullish for them to want. Now, all of a sudden, if they start selling again at, a, at another level, uh-oh, they now feel like this is a price level that they're ready to put their money and bet, you know, double down on their, on their bearish position. So that's kind of the things we try to look for to help modulate the timing of when to enter and the timing of when maybe to start lightening up on a particular trade, because as I said, you know, they're not perfect, but they have a pretty good track record over decades of pretty consistently being on the low side when they're on the buy, being on the sell side on the high, pretty consistently. They're not perfect. They get it wrong. And, and, and the good thing is we can determine when they're getting it wrong. When they start buying into, we showed a, a chart of the oats market where they're actually buying into that rally in the oats. Yeah. They totally missed it. They messed up, they got caught, and they and the natural seller now became a buyer. Well, we now could see they got caught. Well, then that totally negates their bearish position. And now it's a one of those wild spe, you know, spike trades of a lifetime that you typically see in a market every once in a while. So yeah, we do use that and it helps formulate our overall thesis of whether we're thinking correctly, whether we're missing something, or you know, what is going on with the whole situation to make sure that you know we're always trying to keep our risk reward you know, in the right framework for, you know, for an overall uh, trade or for an overall year. So. Yeah. And, um, you know, there was one you, you said 
when I, whenever I first started following your stuff, you said one that actually that I still use to this day, which is uh, smart money buying into a flat market. Yes. Um, you know, and to yes. me, that's a very strong signal of smart money buying into a flat market. And then if I get my breakout signal at the same time, it's a really strong signal. Add seasonality into it. You know, you've got a really strong system there. And so, you know, I, I, I've always used the COT reports, but you kind of have a different way of looking at it than most people, because most people are, oh, it's, they're buying, oh, <laughs> they're selling, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and it, that's, it's, it's more intricate than that. And there's major levels that need to be broken yeah. for it to be significant and so yeah. on. So that's been one very cool thing about listening to you. You also, you also bring a great point that, you know, looking for multiple modalities to give you the signal. All right. Smarts are bullish. Technicals are bullish. Agronomy is bullish. Currencies. The more we can find highly correlated indicators that are pointing in the same direction, the more confident we are about you know, what we're doing. And so, you know, we don't, they don't all have to be aligned, but enough of them have to be aligned where we're saying, you know what, this is time to, you know, enough of these are saying that our risk reward is getting pretty favorable here. Yeah. Let's go do this. And so I, I think you make a outstanding point that never rely on one thing mm -hmm. i would even say don't even rely on two things rely on three or four things that you have found highly correlated in the past to you know getting trades generally right but not perfect so yes absolutely and for myself you know i, I uh, the first person i learned a lot from was larry williams uh, he had yeah. back in the day you know and and he would consider himself and i still consider myself on the same term as him which is conditional trading which is looking at multiple things you know he also is a person who looks at smart money he's looking yes, he does. at yeah correlations he's looking at different assets relative strength intermarket you know all of these things really go together um does he really look at the micro and the fundamentals no um but does he look at all these other things so because there's many ways to, to trade there's there's sure. obviously many ways and it all comes down to probability there's no way we can sit here today and say i know this for sure i don't <laughs> i never will you know like it'll it'll never happen no. i think i think plenty of things but that doesn't mean it's going to happen so you always have to have your risk set up you know be willing to say you're wrong get out of trades and so on um uh, but like we're talking about which taking all of these things putting them together it's really important. And I think it's thing a lot of people miss because they want the Holy grail. Oh, I just have to buy when the RSI hits blank, you know, or I, or I just have to do this over the 200 day moving average. Or if I read this value <laughs> thing, you know, I'm going to buy this stock, you know, it, it just doesn't work that way. No. Well, well, what will happen is you'll paper trade it successfully 10 trades in a row. And then when you finally put your money in it, it won't work. <laughs> 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 exactly you know uh, and, and that's so funny because that happens so many times and yeah. you know i think a lot of people you get fr you get frustrated especially new traders and we have a lot of new traders that watch this and they'll they'll get frustrated because for example i i use a lot of breakouts um and you know if you trade breakouts they're the most frustrating thing on earth half the time they fail and all these things happen but if you understand the underlying drivers if you can continue to take that trade because once again it's a probability bet you know if you if you're making if if 10 trades work out of 20 you have to keep taking after those losing trades you know and that that's how it works yeah. Uh, you can't just go into a trade and, and lose once and say, oh, shit, you know, this, this entire thing is crap. I'm never going to use any of this ever again. Conditional trading. What are these guys talking about? You know, using five different indicators or smart money. You know, I tried this thing. You know, you know, you have to really continue to do it and you have to have that grit on top of all of these different indicators like we're talking about. Because I every good trader I've ever met, like you, like yourself, uh, you know, we all use multiple things and it's all yes. different. It's all different. Yes. And, and, and the other thing is, you know, um, the more you, you read about, you know, really successful traders, like whatever's Peter Brandt or some of the other ones out there, and you'll hear him talk about, yeah, I had three years. I made no money for three years. I got in a rut. I couldn't make any money. I kept, you know, I, you know, I just kept making mistakes. And you think this guy, he'll never, he never make, he's always making, no, it, actually it's not true. And then he, and then he got himself saying, okay, I got out of my zone. I started focusing on things I'm not supposed to focus on, get back to the basics. What do I do well? What do I do good? What are my indicators? Let's get back on track. And then all of a sudden, you know, he had the best year, one of the best years of his career on the fourth year. So, yeah. you know, I, th I think that's, you said that self-awareness, that self-recognition, we all are susceptible 
to you know straying away yeah. just because that's just the way it's just natural right yeah. um and you find and stop yourself when you see you're going down and say all right it's not working this is not what i want to do get back to where i'm at and then and then go back forward again and have confidence in what you've always done and will continue to do and get away from those things that are not working and uh, and catching yourself before you know it does too much damage to what you're doing it's very important to we're all susceptible to that including me including you including peter brandt you know one yep. of the most successful traders of all time <laughs> yeah exactly and that's what i like about your your uh the way you look at cot reports because i think of systems not as something everybody needs and to follow you know completely i think of systems and systematizing what you're doing as kind of bumpers like on bumper bowling i i'm not going to always be right because i have a system but maybe it's going to keep me from being in the gutter you know if all of my systems start to get bearish and i'm thinking really bullish maybe i'm not gonna buy you know <laughs> so, so you know if you can at least have something like that to say okay like you know everything i have is bearish but i'm bullish on this thing i'm not going to do anything with it you're going to save yourself a lot of trouble and i said that earlier i said there's times I'm, I'm really excited about a market and and my other i'm not getting it yeah and, and you can't force it you can't just like well that's what i'm doing it anyway no 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 <laughs> It's not there. So you just, as much as you want to do the trade, because this one thing that you really feel strong about, you got to walk away until other things align up. Um, if, 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 and when they do, it's hard to do, but very important because better to, to miss a trade than to enter a trade and, and, and have it really hurt you. you know, yeah. That, that's why I look at it. Good points. Great points. Uh, so, you know, you, you talk a lot about weather. Uh, and you, you understand this in a way that I do not, I'll be honest. Um, and, you know, I don't think a lot of people uh, really do. And so this is why I subscribe, you know, why I, why I read, why I've learned, um, because you really seem to have a great grasp on it. Um, every year you're kind of coming out like th this winter uh, that, or last winter that came up, you know, you were talking about the possibility of all these things. Lo and behold, Texas, you know, <laughs> the whole yeah. situation kind of comes yeah. to happen. Yeah. Um, you know, how do you, what, what are you looking at for climate cycles um, and how do you see this happening? Well, before I answer that, I, I want to, explain what I think is wrong about current weather forecasting. Mm -hmm. Please. Current, we current, current weather forecasting, what they're taught in schools is that um, you need to be an expert on fluid mechanics and all these you know, differential equations, which I took in school, by the way. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's all well, wonderful. And these are, these are very smart, male winning people, but what they're unfortunately trying to do is they're trying to make a forecast off of a forecast. Meaning that their forecast is is based upon another forecast being right. So it's hard, so it's hard enough to make to be right on a forecast to be right on a forecast of a I mean, and it just doesn't work. It simply doesn't. Work. There's too many variables. That the minute the second this forecast changes, then your forecast changes because it wasn't a forecast based upon original information. So what I went out to do is said, we know through Turing analysis, through ice core sampling, through historical records that the Earth's climate has varied widely for hundreds, thousands, and tens of thousands of years naturally. It's gotten hot, it's gotten cold, lots of droughts, lots of floods, lots of calm weather. I mean, we've had it all. Mm -hmm. The, the you know, record glaciers, no glaciers, everything. We've had it all. Um, and so something drove all of that. Naturally, something drove all that. So I just went about a lifelong of learning decades ago, you know, what are the cycles that I could find? We're talking about correlations and you know, what can I find that correlated with weather? Mm -hmm. and, and so I started coming up with the sun cycles being a very important cycle to follow in terms of when it's firing up or when it's quieting down. So it's a 220 year cycle. Um, the planetary cycles, that is to say that we know, of course, that the tides go up and down every day based upon the sun and the moon's influence on our ocean. So we know the Earth is influenced by the space. We know this. So why is it so hard to think that Saturn and Jupiter, these massive planets with massive magnetic fields, gravimetric fields, uh, charge, charges and, and torsional forces impacting the sun and the moon and the Earth are also having an impact? And remember, they're all spinning around their axis and around the sun at different levels. That's why climate is always changing. Yes. Because these forces are always in motion. There is no such thing as 
steady climate. That is a myth. Yeah. Climate is always changing. So what my job is, is to try to determine which way is the change. We talk about trends, right? There's mm-hmm. trends. And whether the trends aren't, you know, the trends can be a couple of weeks, but I'm looking for the, you know, the multi-year trends that really impact production in the longer term, you know, one, two, three, five, ten kind yeah. of years. Um, you know, what are those cycles um, that really drive the, which way is it changing? And what do I need to do as a price forecaster? What does my producer need to do as a producer? Um, and what does a trader need to do with this information, how it's changing to position for what's likely to occur with production, with demand and with fundamentals and that sort of thing. And yeah. so that's really where, you know, we uh, came up with this various cycles. There's like I said, there's thousand year cycles, there's 220 year cycles, there's 60 year cycles, there's one year cycles. And so what we do is we have them, we have them all spread out, mm. right? All these different cycles all spread out. And anyone that knows whether it's cycles and you can do cycles in price forecasting yep. in, in a price chart, yep. it's done all the time. It's, it's not so much the cycles themselves as when the cycles synchronize. Yes. They're all down, they're all up or enough of them are synchronized in like we talk about these, you know, multiple things saying the same thing. When all these cycles are saying the same thing, you have your, an opportunity for an amplified pattern yes. for a very solid trending pattern for an extended period of time. If they're on opposite sides, they kind of cancel each other out and you're not really going to get much. So mm-hmm. the point I've tried to make over the last many, many years is that we've entered this unique period where majority of the cycles that we've determined are highly correlated with weather changes are all synchronized right now. For the first time since 1600, it's the last time we had the various cycles we follow in sync. And so that tells us that we are, should expect a wildly volatile, extra amplified pattern in weather, meaning take what you would normally expect and blow it out in order of magnitude beyond what you would normally expect. And because of that, we would expect price volatility to do the same thing. Meaning if weather's volatile, price is going to be volatile. Um, and a producer who's, ex- who's normally expecting to have eight good production years out of 10, now maybe he can only expect three or four good years out of 10. And in that scenario, he has to definitely change his market. One of our recommendations back in the August, from August of 20 uh, into last year or this year was that farmers should take their grain and stick it in the bin and not sell it unless they had to pay bills. As you went over, one of our top recommendations. I remember that, yeah. Throw it in the bin, forget about it, sell what you have to. This is not the year to go selling all your, you know, selling the following year like you would normally be doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, that was a tremendous recommendation, as you know, because the market just took off and it kept going and yeah. kept going. A lot of these um, grains are, are insane right now, you know. But so <laughs> many farmers did stick to their normal marketing sold a ton of 380 $4 corn, you know, and, and missed out on the whole thing. And now their costs are going up and they don't have the revenue to offset it because they, 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 you know, they didn't alter their marketing plan. So, so that's really important. And a trader is the same thing. Mm-hmm. You know, if you get into these extreme weather cycles, we're not just going to have a one month move. We're going to have, you know, we're going to have a long term move in these things. You know, it's not going to be, oh, you go up and you come back down. No, no, it's, is this going to be, so, so I think that's really where we feel right, we're in this 10 or 15 year cycle where our, where the sun cycle, the sea surface temperature cycle um, are really in alignment for a wild volatility cycle. Um, and that allows for much, much more difficult production. And we've been seeing productions just not growing like we've been accustomed to over the last two to three years. A great example is the Russian wheat crop. Uh, Russia in 2010, 11 had an historic drought it only and, and they were they were producing about 15 to 20 million metric tons. Production grew, 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 grew. Weather was great. Weather was great, grew, grew. And then they became the number one exporter in the world, like the dominant exporter of wheat in the world in 2019. And since 2019, their production has been flat to down, meaning they've had three years of not being able to grow their yield anymore. Not being a, it's not that they haven't pr- planted it, they had, but the yield hasn't shown up because there's weather volatility has prevented them from this steady rise. And the same, you can look at chart after chart after chart, whether it's the coffee chart uh, in Brazil, whether, you know, 
was the yields have stopped growing in the last three years. Now one could say, well, that's just a short-term cycle, Sean. Mm-hmm. It's gonna, it's mean reverting. We're gonna go back to normal. Everything's great. We don't think that's actually the right call here. We think this is something different. We're entering a different situation where this is actually going to be more normal. Yes, we're going to have a couple of good years of weather. I'm not saying that, Mm -hmm. but that we're going to have two or three years of good and six, seven, eight years of bad. And that's going to mean a lot more upside weather volatility and much longer term trends over time. Um, And so that's really where I think, and, and I want to be very clear. Our models and the way what we do isn't going to help tell you what the weather is going to be next week. I, mm-hmm. I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not structured for that. I, it's a, those are micro things and I'm not set up to tell you what it's going to do next Tuesday afternoon. I, maybe one day I'm going to, I'll be able to create a mouse trap that can do that. I haven't, I haven't been able to do it yet, but actually to be right about agriculture, I don't need that forecast. Yeah. I just need the general f- forecast of what the summer pattern is going to be what the winter pattern whatever i just need a general i get the big pic what's the big picture if i get that big picture right i'm going to get the volatility right and i'm going to get the overall production situation right and and that's all i need to be right about not what is it going to do two weeks from now and um and so that's really what we focus on and you know we you know we look we look at the short-term models like everybody else because there's nothing else to look at right now and you do your best and we try to utilize what we understand to know where the models may be right may be wrong and we share some of that in our in our writings but for the most part our value is what what's what's the big picture here yeah okay. which fits with your time frame uh yes. and that's what it's very important you know like we talked about earlier like it, everything has to fit your time frame and if yes. it's not fitting your time frame it's not doing you any good and also people you also subscribe to and people you talk to like if you're taking advice from people that are you know looking at that two week time frame it's not going to do you any good uh it, it's going to crush you basically yes. it's do the opposite of what, what the opposite of good basically and yeah. also getting back to you you know what you're talking about uh you know a lot of people don't know in the in the 70s and my uncle would tell me about this he was a, he was a big agricultural investor uh he looked at all these things you talk about the global cooling era you know we yeah. had global cooling uh yeah. now it's global warming now it's yeah. climate change you know and it's yeah. it's all you know there there's a lot of money and things behind all of that you know we don't need to get into all of that at the right. moment but it's this is why that kind of happens and so you know really looking at it and going like objectively like hey we have seen this happen throughout time you know whether there was cars uh you know the industrial revolution anything this has all happened so you know as traders we need to stop focusing on this one fact and going okay the trend is obviously this way for warming let's say you know you're you're believing this so you're going okay the trend is like this forever that's not the case you know you, you have to understand that these things change we get into these cycles these cycles will go up and down over time and you know with your time frame this works out perfectly and i i've i've loved listening to you on this subject a lot because it's something that i i have researched a bit but you seem to really dig into it much better than most people and so it's, i'm sure a lot of people get a lot of value out of that thanks for explaining all that yeah, I, I hope so. You know, it, it, it's, uh, it's a little foreign. You know, when I go out and I, and I speak to a, a group, what I find is that most people know bits and pieces of what I discuss, mm-hmm. but it's, it's, the, it's how, when you bring it all together and how it's all connected and, and it works like a beautiful, well-timed clock, that, that that's the, like the light bulb that goes off when I speak to someone. You know, some people, I kind of knew the sun was involved. I kind of knew the sea surface temperatures were involved. I kind of knew the jet. You know, but when you bring it all together and how they work together, then then all of a sudden they go, ah, now I understand how this works. It yeah. Makes more sense to me, and and I and and, and that, um, you know, I get great uh, uh, gratification in in helping producers and traders get a little bit of understanding of that because at the end of the day, look, what I think needs to happen here, um, beyond you know making money on markets and making sure my farmers do well. You know, there's a humanitarian side to all of this, that if I'm correct about what is to take place here over the next 10, 15 or 20 years, you know, we're, we're not going down the right path with our, what we need to be doing as a society uh, to prepare for this. As yeah. I said, I can't control what the sun's going to do, what the plants are going to do, what the, how the climate's going to change. All I can do is say, I'm pretty sure it's going to change that way. What can I do to adapt, innovate and, 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 and you know, thrive through it? Um, and I just feel it's important that, you know, as quickly or the more that 
those around get on the idea of what's really happening here, then we can start making some different decisions that's better for humanity going forward than some of the decisions I think we're making that are, I think will be proven to be very, very counterproductive because um, they're based on a, uh, a data set uh, and a causal effect that I don't believe has a good evidentiary base behind it. Let's put it that way. So. Yeah. And, you know, Texas was a, it was a great example of that. You know, you've been talking about this for a while and then it happens. You know, Texas, nobody was prepared. Everybody's moving off of fossil fuels. Everything's bad for you. Everything's this and moving at that rate and trying to do things. You know, they ended up missing something major. And then a lot of suffering happened. A lot of animals, you know, a lot of a lot of people. So you're, you're absolutely right. And so I think it's really important. And I think a lot, I wish a lot more people would kind of be open to it because it's you, when you talk to people about it, it's, it's always a pushback, you know, like, oh, I've learned this way and it has to be this way. And it's, you know, it would be much easier for you to come on and be like, well, it's, it's this way, you know, <laughs> it's, it's hard to fight against the grain uh, all the time. But in reality, if it's the truth, that's what you're going for. That's what like, you know, people with integrity, that's what they do. They don't care if it's right or, or they, they, well, they care if it's right and accurate. They don't care to be with the rest of the herd. So, you know, what you're putting out is right and accurate. And it's important that, you know, people pay attention. Well, my degree is in chemistry. So I, I fully endorse the scientific process, which, is, which says we never at any moment in time know everything there is to know. We never know 100% of the truth, but we should always be seeking Mm -hmm. the truth. And so the scientific process is an open-ended document that's subject to change. And as it was move along, new information comes in, it makes it that much more true over time. So I've, you know, I didn't develop it. I went out and researched all these extremely smart people and just took all that smart data and brought it in to this working model. But by no means do I have everything there is to know. And I, I, I am learning every day. There's more things to go in. I have some things I'm thinking wrongly about, but the bottom line is that's okay. Mm -hmm. That's all right. And I only care, I care about a lot of things, but the number one thing that I care about in terms of what I do for a living, I care about getting the forecast right as much as I possibly can. And the only way that I can do that is I need to get the weather as one of those important variables right as much as I possibly can. If, for example, CO2 worked in helping me develop more accurate price um, weather forecasts and climate forecasts, that I would be jumping up and down and telling everyone that this is an important metric like, like these other things. And, and it's really, really critical. I have not found that that will do that for me. Now I have nothing against it. Mm -hmm. And I, if it, I mean, I, I have nothing personal against it. If it worked, it worked. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I'm just looking at the data, whether it can help me or not. Yep. And, 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 and if someone has an information or a data set that I don't have that says it, can be used to predict the weather mm -hmm. well shoot maybe maybe i can do a heck of a better job than i'm doing now because i haven't been incorporating it so i want everyone to understand that you know i i am not one of these that i know everything it's my way or the highway no here's a process here's a scientific process here's a bunch of information that i've learned that's working pretty well it's subject to change subject mm -hmm. to revision um and and if i find in the future that something like co2 can help me, mm -hmm. then I will use it. Yeah, I just haven't found it yet. So, and and that, what you said also is important because as a speculator, you have to have that um, in your head that you're not right all the time. You have to go into almost every trade knowing the downside, knowing what can happen to you. Uh, you know, I never think about the upside in trades anymore. I haven't done that since for for many years. And I think new traders are always, you know, they'll, especially with the crypto revolution, you know, they, they have the conversation with me and they're like, oh, Dogecoin. And I'm like, I don't even know what it is. <laughs> like, like, like I, I'm a crypto guy and I don't really understand the hype behind it. Um, but they'll, you know, they'll talk about it and they'll have this, uh, oh, and it's going to hit a dollar target in their head. 
Now, well, why is it going to hit a dollar? Oh, Elon Musk or, or some, you know, and, and they're always thinking about this upside. They're going to sell when they make, you know, a million or they're going to sell when they hit this. And in reality, like a good trader just goes, well, you know, I can lose this. Hopefully I make this, you know, like that. that's it. And also, you know, that ability, like you said, you're, you're humble, that ability to understand that you don't know everything. Uh, you know, Victor Sprandio came on and talked with us about his, his trading and and how, um, you know, as a, talking to an analyst and an analyst saying he knows something for sure. And he talk, he uses anchovy prices, you know, and, and, you know, once again, it's one of those things that you just can't know all everything you, you can't, something could change that could change a variable very quickly. So you have to be nimble, have to be willing to get out and change your ideas. I think, you do, I mean, you do have to have the courage of your conviction that if you do have Mm -hmm. Another, you know, you, you you have to at some point say I'm willing to make an aggressive move here on something, mm -hmm. not knowing you may not be right. You know, you do have to have courage of your conviction. You know, trust but verify. You know, trust yeah. but verify. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's because because in the end, it you wouldn't be entering a trade or a hedging recommendation if you didn't think the upside or the downside, which way which way you're looking at it. Yeah. It wasn't substantial enough, or else you wouldn't be looking at it if you didn't think it was a big opportunity. So yeah. the opportunity, if you're right, it, it, it's there. Yeah. If your scenario plays out, it's all there. The mm -hmm. question is, if I'm wrong, as you said, or if something else comes along, when is my downside or where do I, you know, limit the downside um, and give up that idea that I thought I was right? You know, and that's very important that, you know, you can run a, you can run a trade, <laughs> Uh, considerably lower than you, you really intended just because you didn't want to get out, get, get, get off of the, the, the dream that you would eventually be right on something. It's very hard to yeah. do, but, but over time, if you lose enough money in your early days, you just learn to stop doing that. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true because that's, that's the one thing I, I talk to people about a lot when they're starting to trade. I, I had a buddy who hit me up and he's like, I got 50 K I'm thinking about starting to trade. You know, what do you think I could make in a year? And I said, you have 50 K. I said, I don't know. You, 30k and he goes i'll make 30k i said no you'll probably lose at least half of it. and he he hung up the phone on me you know and i was like no that's the truth because as you first start trading like it's a it's a very tough thing to do because it's so against human nature um but at the same time like you can learn it it just takes time it takes courage it takes grit and also then that ability to be humble so it's like two things that are completely like you have to be very confident but then also be willing to be wrong, you know? And so all of these things kind of come together and like, we're all talking about so many different variables yeah. all at once. And, and, you know, and, you know, like I own a thousand shares of a stock, you know, goes up a dollar down a dollar, you know what it means, but you know, I own one contract of coffee. Well, it's 37,500 pounds. You know, you, you, you don't have the same like cause and effect, you know, and then all of a sudden you realize, you know, coffee's down 10 points to go, Oh, I have, how much am I down? On? I, only, I only have one. I only have one contract. You know, yeah. I only have one share. No, no, you don't have one share. You have, you have 37, 37, pounds of coffee. That's what you have. Yes. You know, and you got to, it's, it's a, it takes a while to get your bearings about what, what are you actually owning here and, and, and what it means and the moves and how it, it's, it's very, very different from anything else that you've ever dealt with, whether it's a house, whether it's stocks, whether it's bonds or anything else, very, very different to understand, you know, how quickly you can get into trouble if you're not careful. <laughs> yeah, well, you know? that, that, that's the futures market, you know, and that's that's the one thing that I think a lot of people don't really come in and put together, which is the fact that when you're in futures and you're you're trading like a you know a one lot of coffee, it's a it's a pretty pretty not huge but pretty big contract, very volatile, yeah. um, natural gas. Uh, very volatile. You can get small contracts, but it's so volatile. It's almost as volatile as that one coffee contract. You know, if you're in the mini natural gas contracts, natural gas <laughs> makes coffee look like you're watching paint dry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and, and there's plenty of like, you know, and I talk to um, a lot of traders, like I, I talk, I trade natural gas uh, a lot. And obviously this, I just take the size smaller. And, you know, I talked to a lot of traders and they'll be like, oh, you, you can't trade natural gas. It's the widow maker trade. Like it's yeah. impossible to trade. It's like, no, it works like anything else. It's just more volatile. People trade Bitcoin. It's more volatile. So, you know, take your sizing down on some of these positions that are more volatile. If you're trading a bond, sure, you can trade huge size. 
Um, yeah. it, it, it's it's very one uh, percent move in a day in a bond is happens once in a great while. One percent move in natural gas happens every minute, every day, every hour, yeah, <laughs> every half hour. I'm watching. I'm watching my uh, my position right now, and I, it, it's hit one percent up and down in the last twenty minutes. So yeah, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> it, but the, okay, so actually getting into to that is, is our last question, which is um natural gas like you 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 brought up an interesting thing uh last week which was that natural gas kind of overshot to the downside um and i i see the same thing you're seeing on it uh what are you seeing in natural gas prices and why do you think that it's just overshot to the downside um and then where do you see it headed from here well first you know you, you always have a game plan of what you would like the market to do when you're thinking of buying or thinking of saying, of course, it never exactly happens that way. It never gives you exactly what you want, but you have to have a framework. So over the summer, you know, I had this great, great, this phenomenal idea that we we're going to have a very, very warm fall mm -hmm. and that natural gas prices were going to crash in October, early November. And I was going to get a chance to buy it really cheap ahead of this cold winter. Mm -hmm. Perfect game plan. Unfortunately, Hurricane Ida came along. We talked about the rogue wave that changed everything. Yep. Went right, right over the production areas, but didn't hurt the LNG terminals. So you had this massive mismatch. Mm -hmm. And the natural gas market exploded higher, totally ruined my game plan. Mm -hmm. They blew out the volatility premiums and the options. The market took off. Everyone's now talking about shortages and we have a cold winter. <laughs> the whole thing got screwed up. And I was like, this is ridiculous. I, I lost my trade. This is the, yeah. the trade's over. <laughs> totally overshot to the upside. Just totally. It was warm enough. They kept running it up. So the bottom line is, so we overshot to the, to the, to the upside. And so now we're feeling the hangover from that. Mm -hmm. Meaning that the market had all pumped up on Ida. Well, Ida ended, production came back online, and you know, and, we're, we're, and we really haven't started winter yet. And so now uh, the market says, oh, it's been warm. <laughs> it was warm when you ran it up in October. Now it's overshooting because everybody's giving up on the trade. They hate the stock, uh, the, the, the natural gas. It's the widow maker again. Yep, yep. <laughs> I knew I shouldn't have done this. So all, so everybody's out. So my view is all the hurricane I does with apostrophe S are out. Yeah. And now we're really, we're ready to reset the psychology and reset the market to a new trade, a completely new trade, like completely. I think we have to separate that trade ended now. And now we're starting the one I really wanted to participate in. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't, see, I didn't, I, I was looking for an active hurricane season, but, but you know, I couldn't, I didn't, you know, I just missed that whole thing. Felt like dope because that was one of my top recommendations as natural gas and I missed it. But bottom line is so where I think we are now, we're just we're left for dead. Uh, we're, we're at the bottom. Markets actually volatility for natural gas actually calmed down. Yeah. The volatility premiums and options have been crashing. Um, everyone's bearish now. Yep. And so, and so, you know, my smart money algorithm is showing some really exciting uh, activity. Mm -hmm. um, and I do believe we're about ready to, you know, kind of trigger um, the winner here as we get into the end of this month. And, and so um, I think now the market looks very interesting. I, you know, as, I, as, I, as you know, I'm not a big technical person, but I do look for signs that the market's ready to trade something different. I used March trading a weekly close over 380 as a technical uh, marker for me yeah. to, to get me confidence that this basing period might be over. We're ready to trade this winter weather pattern that I'm looking for. Um, so that's kind of where I think we're at. I think we're at a point where I'm pretty confident the market is, is in a bottoming phase. I don't know if it'll be bottoming phase for another week, another two, but I think once we get that technical confirmation that my smart money is telling me, that my weather models are telling me, um, that, that I think that we're ready to trade the, the winter market that I've been really wanting to trade along. Then it's up to me and you and everyone else. Well, how long is it gonna rally? Yep. How high is it going to go? And, you know, and, and all that sort of thing. And then, you know, we'll, obviously those are bridges we have to cross when we get there. But I do think for the first time, you know, really since uh, late summer, this market's looking very interesting again from a risk reward profile. So. 
Yeah, and you know, to another point, because you're talking about the the market and when you would buy, people don't understand that bottoms are messy. They're they're always messy. You know that nothing just crashes and just goes right back up perfectly. Sometimes stocks do, <laughs> but but it doesn't happen much in the commodities market. And so you know these things it, they'll chop around. You know the first day it goes up five percent, everybody's like, oh my god, I missed everything, and you know it'll go back down five percent the next day. These things happen because it's got a really fine footing and then once it really does and gets over a certain zone this right. is when you put the trade on and this is what you're talking about you know you have all your all your signals putting together but i think risk control wise the only thing that really works well is technicals um yeah. so you have to have technicals for that simple reason uh okay. everything else is kind of your bread and butter you put it all together you're kind of sitting there, here's their fundamental reasons. It can work out, but the technicals will be when you can get in. And also it gives you, if you're just buying a dip, you really don't have any place to really put a stop or where to get out. But if you kind of can see, okay, it's gotten up, it's getting over a certain zone. And then you're like, okay, the where the low was, that's where I'm done with this trade. Now mm -hmm. you have another way of kind of setting up your risk control. Absolutely. It's, that's very important, especially with a market like natural gas that it is, it is the wild, wild west commodity of them all. So, yeah. um, and so, you know, as confident as I am about uh, the colder weather coming and as confident as I am about, um, you know, this being a bottoming process, once again, you know, don't know for sure, right? Mm -hmm. So I want the market to tell me that they're ready to trade my idea, my thesis, mm -hmm. um, and then go, go from there. And so, so the risk reward from here at this, you know, where we are now is looking for the first time interesting again after the unfortunate hurricane Ida thing just messed up my whole game plan and 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 had to reset <laughs> reset my entire uh <laughs> way I was gonna handle this thing, which is fine. It happens all the time. And that's what we yeah. talked about. These could change in a hurry and you have to be able to be nimble and, and and say, okay, what do I do now? What do I do now? Yeah. So so the, the one thing we like to end on is if you had some advice for a new new speculator, um, someone just getting into the markets, what would be something you would tell even yourself, you know, as you're kind of getting in, like you said, you're in stocks, you're kind of moving into commodities, you know, what would you tell yourself at that point as you're learning? I would say starting off in this era for the first time, uh, I would view it that you're paying for an education in the beginning, that you expect to pay a tuition for an education, mm -hmm. meaning you're entering something that you know not, nothing about that's extremely different than anything you've experienced before. And what I mean by paying a tuition is you're gonna lose money yeah. in the beginning. And that's actually how you learn. You can read all the books you want, you can read all the information you want, and it doesn't mean that doesn't make you smarter. Mm -hmm. But until you actually go in there with skin in the game, and start doing it yourself and going through the process of putting a trade on and all that goes with it. You don't really, really, truly learn the, the, your style because everyone, as you said, everyone has a different style, a different profile, a different way that they're comfortable with that suits them. There is no one way to do it. There's a lot of ways to do it, but that you have to be comfortable that the plan you choose, you can stay on most of the time. Because if you're saying, uh, you know, Peter Brandt's a great short-term trader. I'm going to do that, but I'm, I don't want to do that. I'm never going to be successful doing Peter Brandt's short-term trading. I'm just pointing that as, as, a, as, a, as an example. I yeah. will fail miserably trying to apply his strategy to, to, to me because I like longer-term, fundamentally indicator-based kind of stuff. I'm just not interested in buying here and selling there and just doing all that technical stuff constantly. That's not what I do. So I say anyone in this in the first time, really just expect you're going to spend some money mm -hmm. in the beginning to learn be open to that, be ready for that. Don't be surprised about that and hone in on what are you comfortable with? Mm -hmm. What is your style? You know, you, you, you know, there could be four people in the room. You have the one guy that's out there shaking everyone's hands and he's just social. And the other person, you know, he just sits there. He's very quiet. You ever ask him a question? He answers it in one word answers. He's just but very cerebral, but extremely smart. And you have those that wish they were totally not there because they don't want to be there. And yeah. you have others that, you know, are, are, are like an open sieve and just absorbing it all in, asking all kinds of questions because they're super inquisitive. All those people are going to be very different in how they trade futures and options if they yeah. were to endeavor in it. And that's so important to match the person 
with the trading strategy. Yes, absolutely. As well said, great advice, because I think a lot of people don't understand the difference of reading about it and skin in the game. Like, <laughs> like you, you, or paper trade, like people will paper trade and they'll be like, oh, look at all the money I've made. I'm like, you're, you don't understand. Once your actual money is in there, you will act differently. Oh, no, I won't. Yes, you will. <laughs> you will at the beginning for sure. Like it takes yeah. a long time. Uh, you know, now as, as we're managing more and more money, I, you know, I can separate myself better and better from it. But, you know, at the beginning, like, you know, a dollar meant something, you know, like, you know, that and, and everything means something when you're just starting to trade and starting to learn because you think in your head, everything's going to go perfectly. Everything's going to go straight up and look at it. I, I read this guy online last week who made so much money. I can't believe I lost money, you know, like, and it's like, you know, you don't understand that most of those people that you're reading online maybe they're not making anything, you know, <laughs> like maybe they've never made any money in trading. You're just reading about it online. You, you don't even know these. Maybe, maybe the plane that's in the back, he just rented it for a half an hour. So he could, yeah. It <laughs> yeah. And, you know, so he could, and you see it on your, you're, you're going through YouTube reading trading videos and you see this commercial with this guy with an airplane and you're like, that might not even be his plane. Like, you know, anything about it. And that's no. the thing you see a lot of these people um, on YouTube these days. And when they're on YouTube and all these things, they're really putting their best foot forward and they're putting, they're driving their Ferraris and all this stuff. And it's like, you know, <laughs> you don't, you don't understand. Number one, like the actual people who have a lot of money, they're not the guys driving around Ferraris, <laughs> you know, like, no. like, like you would, you never see them driving around a Ferrari or being, you know, that type of person. So number one, if you see that, that's a warning sign. <laughs> so 100%. Like you said, you know, you're, you're got to have skin in the game and you got to learn through actually doing it and don't look around at all of these people and think that they're doing something you can't, you know, they they might not be doing anything at all. Yeah. And, 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 um, and, uh, and it doesn't mean you can't, you, you, there are helpful, uh, there's helpful information out there. We all, need, you know, no one knows it all. We all need coaches. We all need information sources that we can utilize to help us do a better job what we do. But at the end of the day, you have to make the decision. Yeah. It's your decision. It's your money. It's your trade. And you, at the end of the day, still have to assimilate other people's information. And you still have to make the right decision for you. You shouldn't be looking to anyone else to make your decision. They can help. They can guide. They, they can give you a, 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 you know, a, a better framework. But you still have to relate, make sure you're the one making the call because the only way that you can do this for the long haul is you still, you have to be able to do it on your own. Yes. So. It's the same, like you, you having your product, you know, like you, you can't say someone can't come up to you and be like, well, you said to buy this. And two days later, you know, they're, your time frame is completely different. And two days later, they're hitting you up and going, well, this went down for two days. You know, what do you think to, you know, it's your time frame's different, you know? So yeah. all of these things really come together um, to really learn how to trade. And also, like you said, it's, it's all about you. Uh, and, and, and the other thing is, Admit when you've made a mistake. Mm -hmm. Hey, I got this one wrong. I didn't see it right. I thought this and it didn't happen. I made a mistake on this one. There's nothing wrong with saying I made a mistake on this. And that's it. I mean, that that's the, 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 the being able to admit that you've made a mistake. Because, you know, you have the other one. Yeah, those people. I've never made a mistake. I, I've always got it right. You know, I'm bullish. I'm bearish. I'm bearish. I'm bullish. I'm bullish. I'm bearish. I'm bullish. I'm bearish. Yeah, I got it right. <laughs> no, I mean, I get it wrong. Of course, I get it wrong. Um, I like to think that you know, I, I get it right more than I get it wrong, and I believe I do. But I definitely get it wrong, and I you know I don't know which one I'll get wrong next. But that's just the way it is. And there's no way to there's no way to avoid that. And you know that I know of, <laughs> yeah. if you know of a way to avoid that, let me know, but, but admitting you're wrong. And I, and I also believe those, if, if, if you're managing money for people mm -hmm. or you're advising people, I think they want, they want to know that you are willing to admit that, you know, you made a mistake. Hey, yeah. just be honest with me. All right. You've made a mistake. You screwed this one up. That's fine. But don't try to con me into thinking that you did make a mistake on this one. Cause it comes off. I think it comes off really, really bad. Oh, I, I do too. I do yeah. yeah, I mean, and there's there's such a difference between being right and making money. You know, there, yeah. there, there's a difference between that. You don't have to be right every time to be a successful speculator. Right. Not at all. Um, and you have to be willing to be wrong to actually be a successful speculator. Yeah. 
And yeah. so it's great, great talking to you. This was awesome. Uh, we're about at that hour point. Yeah. So yeah, perfect. Thank you so much for coming on with us. Uh, it was absolutely a blast talking with you. Thanks, Jason. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for your support, by the way, because without you, obviously, I wouldn't have a job. So I really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Thanks, <laughs>